30 years, the Space Frontier Foundation has been a home for these visionary, radical, action-oriented individuals. Hear their stories, learn how space was shaped, and revel in the revolution of commercial space pioneers. Maybe Tom, just to start out, go as far back as you like. What what was it that got you involved in the space industry in the first place? I wanted to be an astronaut since I was like seven years old. I got up at four in the morning in on, on in October of nineteen sixty two to watch uh, John Glenn fly. I was like eight years old at the time. So okay. uh, my interest in space has gone from earliest childhood on to the present day. You are directly directly influenced by the the great space race by yeah, Mercury yeah. and Apollo and Definitely. I'm I'm an orphan of Apollo. Yeah. What is that just in case there's folks that aren't familiar with that term. That's going to show up later, but sure. what do you mean an orphan of Apollo? Well, ever when when they first landed on the moon in 1969, everyone was calling my generation the children of Apollo because we thought there'd be this bright wonderful future where we're just going to keep expanding our space capacity and we're going on to Mars and we're going to do all these great things and my generation would be at the forefront of that. And so we were called the children of Apollo. Well, by the mid 90s, we began calling ourselves the orphans of Apollo because of policy changes and the advent of the shuttle, which basically for 30 years, we went around in circles orbiting the earth. All of a sudden we had a great program that was doing great things during that period, but we weren't really going anywhere. Ah, but and see, before 1981, we had a space program that was going somewhere to strange new worlds and all that. And this is one of those things that in my time before getting into the industry, I thought that when people said the space shuttle is the most complex machine that humans have ever created, that that was a compliment. And that was something <laughs> too, too loud to say, look at the height of human achievement in this terribly complex machine. And it wasn't until I was in the industry that I started to realize not everyone means that as a compliment. And I, I would imagine you're one of those. Yeah, I so, would be one of those. So yeah. why isn't that a compliment? Because of the, all the promises that they made, uh, when they first pitched the shuttle to Congress, they were basically saying that the launch costs would be reduced to $100 a pound, and uh, we'd be able to fly once a week and do all sorts of amazing things and build lots of space infrastructure like the ISS 20 years sooner than we actually built it. None of those promises came to fruition. The thing is, it's barely reusable as a fully reusable craft. It takes weeks and months to refurbish it before each flight. And you say all that, yeah, all that incredible, exotic, complicated hardware slowed down <clears throat> the process. It wasn't mm. simple enough. We weren't right. thinking simply enough to actually make that thing work. And there were just too many cooks and too many beasts coming in that wanted to have their little piece of what was going on. And so the budgets went out of sight and it had, it was a limited use thing, but that was our thing for 30 years. All right. So you're seven, you want to be an astronaut when the shuttle, do, do you recall any watching shuttle launches like oh, yeah. early on? Oh yeah. For the very first one, very okay. first one, John Young and Robert Crippen in Columbia, uh, that very first launch, I sit and watch that thing live. And it was, uh, and it was very cool to watch. It was even cooler to uh, watch it land for the first time. Things slid in. All of a sudden, the wheels didn't pop out until the very last second. I was at work, and everybody in the room was like watching this thing and just cheering there. So let me go back. Let me go, let's go back. So you're seven. You want to be an astronaut. Yeah, yeah. You're a child of Apollo, and you're going to be crafting the future of space. Or so this I thought. is probably not the one that you thought, but you have crafted the future of space for the children of the orphans from seven to early well, career. Well, let's, let's, let's skip ahead a little bit because here's okay. the, the orphans of Apollo thing. Here's what really happened long ago when we realized we weren't going to have that brilliant space future promised by the Apollo people and the shuttle people, our whole, a lot of our generation just moved on to something else where we could use our creative energy in different ways. This is why we have the internet that we do. And the world we have today is because of those decisions, those bureaucratic decisions and government decisions that were made in the 70s and 80s. That's created us. 
Right. But we never and forgot where we came from. Were you a, a space sleeper agent? I mean, that that Probably. that in, implies that there was like a a an agency to be a member of. But you've served on the board of the foundation. Yeah. You've done a lot of things. What I'm trying to make sure that that we can tap into is also what was happening in that beforehand. So as I understand it, it was Mars that got you. Well, there's a, there's a story there. Because okay. uh, I, I was, I was, had hopes for the shuttle until after 1986. Okay. When Challenger exploded, I lost hopes for the shuttle. And I walked away and I started working on a, you know, what would end up a 31 year IT career. And so you fast forward to about 1996 or seven, this interest, really interesting book caught my eye. And it was, it was called The Case for Mars by Robert Zubrin. And you probably have a copy. I have several. Somewhere, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, I love the, the engineering arguments and the, and the budget arguments. You could get to Mars a lot quicker, a lot faster, and a lot cheaper and stay there for a long time. I thought this was really com a compelling argument. But there was a chapter in there concerning privatization. Okay. And using market forces to actually build private companies that also go out there and do these things as well. I was fascinated by that. I thought, this is where we need to go. I already had done some entrepreneurial things on a small level in the past. I thought, here's a way I can possibly get involved by helping to promote that part of it. When you're reading that, and this is, this is an, an epiphany, but on the, like, yeah. to some people, we're in America, we have a capitalist market driven system why wasn't this obvious like a, 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 to you or to everyone why? three words three words the giggle factor mm. right. you see i i knew going in promoting uh private market solutions for these things when none of them when none at the time had really been proposed that made any economic sense okay the biggest thing <clears throat> you had to fight against was the giggle factor of people laughing at you when you're trying to pr promote these things. And so the struggle and the crux of a lot of my work for the ensuing 10 years or plus 15, I don't know, 20 now, was <laughs> 25, was to ease the giggle factor and start really making a serious business case for certain things. And as technology started improving and they started developing and they started getting cheaper to make, uh, you could better, you were better able to make that business case. So that's where I started looking, looking at that. I even, I had an idea at the time, right around 99, 2000, I actually started a company around it. It's called uh, Colony Fund LLC. And what we wanted to do was, um, was actually promote a large uh, investment fund for even mom and pop to put in a thousand bucks and you treat it and you treat it like a mi an old 19th century mining stock. You know, you put your thousand in, you save it for your grandkids, and maybe it's worth something in 30 years. Talk to me a little bit more about, as you were realizing the um, legal regulatory barriers to bringing startup entrepreneurial mindset into space in the 90s, 90s and 2000s timeframe, I mean... Why didn't that work? Isn't that what uh, Airbnb and Uber and Lyft and all well, the rest of them are doing? They're they're saying, well, oh, well, we'll worry about the regulations later. Well, <laughs> no, no, you don't worry about the regulations later when you're dealing with the SEC. Okay. You know, people have gone to prison for filling out a piece of paperwork wrong. The issue was what we didn't have in 2005 that we have now is crowdfunding. Crowdfunding was enabled by the Jobs Act okay. in 2012. And that, that regulatory ratcheted up. Why a 30 year lottery ticket versus um, just in, investing in the latest Silicon Valley thing that's gonna be a unicorn in six months? Like how do, you, how do you frame that 30 year investment? Is it really impossible to ask for both? Because the, uh, the original investment strategy was for a good chunk of the funds raised to go into those kinds of plain vanilla investments in Silicon Valley companies and other kinds of things to keep the cash flow going. And then use the, the, the cash that that throws off to support some of these longer term bets, which, you know, depending <coughs> upon which version a 
I don't know if it's apocryphal. I haven't heard it from his mouth directly, but you know, people like Jeff Bezos had that in mind and is using the money that he's generating off of one thing to build another thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, we had a big chunk, about 70% of it was going to be the kind of stuff that you talked about. We had another maybe 20% mm -hmm. we were going to go straight into different types of space, the space related, <clears throat> or we later called space scalable startups. Yep. And then we had a little percentage set aside for uh, what we called adventure capital. We actually actually helped fund certain uh, specific projects, like landing yeah. a private probe on the back of the moon and get sponsorships for it and try to make it pay for itself. And that's mostly as <clears throat> a show and tell for everybody. Right. I'm going to ask what may be a slightly indelicate question, but did you land a probe on the backside of the moon? No, we didn't. We didn't okay. get, we never, we never got that far with any Has of it at the time. anyone a probe on the backside of the moon yet? China, but they're not a private organization. They're a government. No, they're not. No, they're not. So Thank you me. were, hopefully it's not a Sisyphean task of like constantly <laughs> trying to get this thing there, but yeah, the work that you were doing 20 some odd years ago is being continued today in a different iteration do you see do you see the work that you were doing as loosening the lid for the companies that are you know the clips companies that might be actually landing on the moon or on the dark, the, the far side do, do you see a connection between the work that you were doing then and these successes that are, well, these programs that exist now. In some respect, also a lot of the work I did a little later on uh, was actually, I think, more instrumental in helping that along. I went to other, lots of other conferences, not just Space Frontier, but uh, ISDC, yeah. you know, and uh, other places. And I was always giving talks on the economic aspects or the business development aspects or the capital raising aspects at these conferences. People really had a hunger to hear these kinds of stories and, yeah. and, and learn some things. And, and all right, so that time frame, we're pre-SpaceX, pre-Blue Origin. Yep. We're after the Ansari X Prize, right? Yeah, and after Dennis Tito and after uh, Mark Shuttleworth and even after Greg Olson. And just in case folks don't know who those people were, what was remarkable about Dennis oh, Tito. Well, they were the they were the first three private astronauts who actually were willing to pay the twenty million dollars to ride on a Soyuz and go to yeah. the ISS for a week. Not we're not extending that pricing. That's not I think that yeah. price has expired. Price hasn't really absolutely yeah yet. that was but, that was twenty five years ago it was twenty years ago or almost. So yeah yeah that price has expired. What did space adventures mean twenty million dollars being paid by multiple individuals did that change the tenor of conversation? Well, yes and no, okay. because uh, some friends and I started, we start at that same time, we're starting a, a different conversation entirely, getting so tired of the, the Kool-Aid style boosterism that exemplified new space at that time. Once I realized there's nothing to invest in, and then I really got picky about, okay, I'm looking at everything that everybody floats up there and seeing if there's anything to it at all, right? And most of the time, okay. there was nothing to it at all. The four of us, uh, me, a guy named uh, Sherber Lee, and uh, John, Dr. John Jurist, and Dr. David Livingston, who you may have heard of yep. from his famous podcast, we formed a group and we called ourselves the Space Cynics, a view of alt space from those who don't drink the Kool-Aid. And that actually caught on for a while a lot, we got lots of people writing into us about that when we had a new post. And uh, and we got a few haters too, of course. But uh, we we're just trying to inject some logic and reason and rationality to, into all this. Because actually we want private commercial space to succeed, but not by falling for blind hucksterism and, you know, and P.T. Barnum snake oil tactics, which we got a lot of in those early halcyon days. Yeah. That is a perpetual thing for those that are supporting a cause to make yeah. sure that the cause doesn't completely overwhelm your brain functions. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> friend, I used to say, if you open the door to everyone, anyone will walk in. Yeah. <laughs> so you got to watch so, out for that. 
So you were committing time and resources. You believed that there was some market here as you were forming the cynics. Like, what was the driving for it? But like, why didn't you just check out? Well, because I had this at this point after 98, 99 period, even though, you know, the colony fund initiative didn't go very far, the principles were still there. And I was absolutely convinced there someday would be a big future in private commercial space activity. Do you think the quality of the business rationale, the quality of the like, okay, here's a thing that is worth doing because of its ability to generate profit. Do you feel like that is better now or worse than- Oh, vastly better. Vastly better. Vastly better. The younger generation today really looked at what their dads were doing and uh, and really took a look at it and figured out, yeah, we need a business case and we need a business model. All right, so, and I know we're jumping back and forth over time. That's fine. If you were- another generation offset. So I'm going to take your 80s. Shuttle is running. You're an enthusiast, but not really involved. You're making a career where there's a career to be made, right? Is there an alternate history that would have drawn you in sooner? I think the alternate history, if either stop the shuttle business or or built a better one was actually lived up to the hype. If it actually was smaller and leaner and easier to operate and fully reusable with with a week or two turnaround, uh, that might have really changed the whole conversation about what we were doing up there. And probably with a and with a really cheap ride to orbit, probably a lot of private companies would love to t- to have taken advantage of that. Not just put up satellites, but maybe pieces of things that would eventually be assembled into private space habitats that one of these days they would send people to in uh, cheaper but reliable capsules that they built themselves. And that might have happened when we're doing this now, but that might have happened 20 years sooner. Can you imagine that drawing you out of the, you know, the IT tech Absolutely. world? Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I would have really considered that. I could I'd go back and get a little more engineering background or, or some admin, more administrative background and uh, and just, you know, dive my way in there and make what contacts I could and, and be involved and, somehow. Yeah. And yeah. In an alternate history, I may have already flown six months on a private commercial space station. And yeah, now I'm uh, an old retired private astronaut talking to people like you. And is there a better way to spend your now? There's plenty of better ways to spend your, <laughs> your time, but it's. The reason the reason why I'm 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 picking and probing at these things is that those of us who maybe weren't alive when you know since humans have left the moon, yeah, or roundabouts, um, grew up with a different framework and a different understanding. Our history as a species in space isn't that long, but it has gone through so many twists and turns that the world that we have today comes because of the choices that you and others made throughout this whole time. And, you know, the big question then is, all right, once we understand how things evolved, what is it that we should be doing now so that we can do another one of these things? um, And maybe I'll be in the gray hair category and talking about all these great things that we did. And that's why, I think this is an important thing, even to ask the questions about when you weren't in space, because there were people and others that have been that were very passionate about it. Even their passion wasn't enough to bring you over until a little bit later, right? Mm-hmm. So just being passionate isn't in itself enough. Right. Right. Why did the shuttle disaster that when it, when it blew up? Why did that? Not, why did that strip you of? your your interest in space was because people died was no no it wasn't that i mean these are the risks when you go to space i didn't like uh i i didn't like how that disaster happened it could have been avoided but there was a lot of bureaucratic pressure to launch that day uh everybody was saying take off your engineering hat and put on your management hat and that's what happened as a result of that i think nothing 
asserted that better than the late great Richard Feynman, who was the head of, of, the, of the committee investigating the challenger, he asked somebody, one of the contractors, there's a million to one chance of failure of this thing. And he said something on the order of, on what do you base such an abiding faith in the machinery? And it was just a stunned silence in the room. How, how do you answer that question? So that raised a lot of doubts. And then there was, of course, the thing where he, he, he took a little rubber mock-up of an O-ring and stuck it in some ice water to show everybody what would happen to it. And that was a very visual representation. Did you actually follow the investigation? Yeah. Okay. Because my experience, a little bit younger, I was in grade school. You know, we're all shocked. And then you hear about it on the news. But you were in a different, you had a different perspective on this. So you actually... Yeah like paid attention to the news. Absolutely. Was I was out. already in my early thirties and had a real job. So yeah, I, I got that. And I was, I was very fascinated by it. But and, I, I could you... see where, when the point I was trying to make by that is I could yeah. see where this was going in terms of long-term policy and long-term planning and government space was always going to have some kind of future uh, private commercial efforts. And basically, by private commercial efforts, I just mean putting lots more people into space, which we still have a problem with. Yes, we do. You know, which is another challenge. I, I didn't see much of a future there. And so I put my head down and focused on, on things that I could change and could influence until the late 90s came along and I saw yeah. cracks were opening in that, in that Hadrian's Wall. I stepped through and started, you know, doing new things. It became an advocation rather than a way to make a living, but I still have it to this day. You have a time machine and you can go back to, you know, 80 something and tell yourself to make a bet which of the two superpowers would have a seat for sale to go to space and which one would not have the ability to put humans in space. Yeah. Would you like, is there any number of possible iterations where you would have said the former Soviet Union would be the, the one with a commercial capability? Well, that I know. I probably wasn't thinking in those terms at that point. I was thinking as a long-term policy strategy where, you know, NASA, who's been the absolute, you know, gatekeeper all these years, would finally let loose the reins a little bit. And that takes me back, and this is you know, here's my other observation going back to even pre-shuttle, because the shuttle came about because basically a decision was made at NASA that after Apollo officially ended in 1975, somehow we needed to keep the band together. We needed to keep the team together no matter what. We needed to come up with something to do it. And the shuttle was ginned up as an idea to keep the team together. That didn't work out so well. If they right. went a different way and said, you know what? We're not going to go into fancy programs. We're going to keep what we have. We're also going to share our toys, share our knowledge openly with the private commercial sector and not stand in their way of taking those things that we built and innovating from them and make, creating their own capacity for the good of the country and the good, the good of the economy. Think where we might have gone. We might still have a shuttle, but maybe Boeing built it. Yeah. And they and built it different and better and cheaper and easier to operate and actually reusable. Yeah. Not just yeah. refurbishable. I mean, and so if they'd made that decision instead and gone back into being an exploration agency and an R and D agency with their, yeah. all their probes of other planets and other planetary moons and everything else, giving people that excitement, giving them a reason to keep going out there. Look what we found on Enceladus. Oh my God. There's water geysers spewing out of that thing. Look at this. You know, people get excited. And so <clears throat> I want to go see that. I want to do something with that. There must be something we can do to help promote space settlement. And here's a source of fresh liquid water right there. Okay. So bef before I ask you to put a cherry on the top, I want to talk about one of the programs that grew out of the Space Frontier Foundation uh, in the business plan competition. So oh. can you talk a little bit about that and sure. how that sure. To be. Well, interestingly, the business plan competition actually started, you know, in the early 2000s. Their main uh, sponsor was the Heinlein Prize Trust, and they put up, you know, a thousand dollars or twenty five hundred bucks or something like that. They, it was basically a, just a short pitch event in, in the beginning. They had maybe half a dozen companies, you know, 
just pitch in their deal and they get a few questions from some judges, including people like, you know, Art Dula and Buckner Hightower from like uh, Heinlein. And they would turn around and decide, okay, okay, who wins? We started taking that to a new level in uh, 2009 where we did one where we actually started doing something called a boot camp. And for about a day and a half before the event, and this is during the conference, uh, the Space Frontier Conference, uh, you meet in a, in a big room and we go over every aspect of your presentation and of all sorts of business related things and finance related things. But everybody had a chance to practice their pitch actually in front of each other, in front of a room full of people who were poking holes in it and everybody got better. And all of a sudden the event itself on game day, it became so much better than it ever had been. And that's a model we use to this day. Did you copy this off of the Silicon Valley boot camps? It had to come from somewhere. Nothing happens in a vacuum. Probably copied it from various things like that. But we also, the whole idea of the new space business plan competition at that point was to simulate, in essence, a Silicon Valley venture pitch. Yep. You're only going to get 10, 15 minutes. This is how you make that first impression to see if they'll take a second meeting that leads to a third that maybe leads to funding. We've helped promote a lot of companies. I know at least probably a dozen companies that have gotten lots of funding as a result of going through our program. I've known at least 40 other companies that certainly got on the map because of their participation in our program over the years, and we're still doing it. In fact, we've gone international. Last year, we did a business plan competition at the International Astronautical Congress in Paris. That may have actually predated some of these Silicon Valley sessions. Uh, you, may, you might have been actually a prototype that they built off of. So yes, you're right, everyone borrows. As you think about the journey that like you and this whole industry have been on, mm -hmm. the, the enthusiasm, the trough, you know, it's been up and down. If, if you think back, on some of these things that we've we've chatted about, is there are there some unifying themes that you found really resonate for you? Again, I think I mentioned this before. Despite all my space cynicism at a certain period of my life and all the other things that were going on, I always had a firm belief that the development of the space environment, the the settlement of this long term settlement of the space environment, was what the foundation is all about. Yeah. You know, building successful settlements on the moon, Mars, and in orbit, and in the asteroid belt, and wherever else humans choose to go, need to have some kind of <clears throat> economic element built into it. As long as we still have an economic system based on relative scarcity, then uh, until we reach that age of, of abundance, uh, it's there's going to be an economic element to this, and that matters, <clears throat> and you better pay attention to it. You are a long-standing advocate for the commercial, like the, the economics. Um, and yeah. I, I appreciate yeah. that. And I know from my experience, there are more people that think that way, but there's still more work to be done. Um, Absolutely. So there's always work to be done. Continuing <laughs> to, as long as I'm drawing through. breath, I'm going to continue to do it. Um, bef before we wrap, is there anything that, um, the foundation or those watching or I can do for you as you know, we try to carry on all this, this work and carry it forward. Well, Anything we're, we you? we're right now, the center for space commerce and finance is still in the business of putting on space investment summits and new space business plans competition. So if Excellent. you would care to engage us for a future event with the space frontier foundation, we are open to have that discussion always. Uh, so if someone's watching this, who's an aspiring entrepreneur, and once a space venture, make sure you get the track in the business plan competition. And if you're an investor, someone else who's interested in seeing this stuff happen, you've got an organization here that is is already has a long track record of helping these ideas uh, actually mm -hmm. give birth into reality. Um, yeah, and just a quick so. pitch. I mean, we are the yeah. center is the center is actually cscf.space, and uh, we are a 501c3 by the way. So. Uh, there For those go. of you who want to, you know, put on your your philanthropy hat at the end of the year, we're we're happy to hear from you on that too. And any um, any bold predictions or insights or things you want to scare us about? Uh, we got <laughs> a few minutes left before before the camera cuts off. Do you have anything else? Just you know, well, 
I'll throw the I'll throw it out there just to you know stir the pot a little bit. I am still after everything I've seen the last couple of years. I am still convinced that Elon Musk is going to get to Mars before NASA is. Mm, okay. Do you think that's an unpopular opinion, or is that a? I, well, I don't know anymore if it is or not. You know, because okay. Elon's being who he is. You know, the work on Starship has been relentless and steady, and you. But that's how you do it. You do failure after failure after failure after failure, and then all of a sudden, boom, success. They had that first Falcon launch that was successful and put a payload into orbit. It was in 2008, and I happened to be. At, at the IAC, the International Astronautical Congress in Glasgow, where I was actually on the Entrepreneurship and Investment Committee. And that's a new <laughs> thing I helped pioneer. Basic sponsored a, a celebration party at the local pub. You know, it was just a, it was just a chaos. It was a lot of fun. We're just seeing that launch over and over going, they did it, they did it. And so hey. look, look at them now, you know, so. Did that change, did you, was there a difference between the conference before the launch and the conference after the launch? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. At least people like me had a lot more hope for the future than maybe, you know, before, because uh, yeah. it was all just, all just maybe an if and PowerPoint slides. Now all of a sudden, no, this is real. Yeah. Private companies are doing this and they're getting the money to do it and they're succeeding at it. And the, the cost of launch has been significantly lowered now. Yep. And ain't going back up again. And a private company did that and there'll be more to follow. Amen. Well, Tom, again, thank you very much for all you've done and for the time today, chatting about all this kind of history Thanks. stuff. And, glad, uh, glad to do it. Thanks for having me. Any old time, man. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks. Pleased today to have another story about the formation of commercial space. Rob Godwin, <laughs> thanks so much for joining and telling a little bit of story about how you got drawn into this whole space world. Um, what would you say it is that you, you might be well known for in, uh, in the industry? Well, I would hope that it was for, for the, the imprint Apogee Books. We've been doing it now for over 25 years. Um, and as a direct result of having been invited into the, the fold of the Space Frontier Foundation. That's the story that I want, I'd love for you to, to, to share with folks. Before the, the imprint started, what was your, um, do you remember what space was like when you were growing up as a kid? Like, if I go all the way back. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, my, my brother and I uh, were both fanatics watching the space program. Of course, we were, we were in England. We were in the wrong country to become astronauts. But, uh, you know, we watched all of the Apollo missions. Um, I vividly remember Apollo 8 onwards. My brother's a little older than me, and he remembers some of the Gemini missions. Um, I know exactly where I was, you know, when Neil stepped out onto the surface. And we had a tape recorder. We had a reel-to-reel -reel tape deck and set that up in front of the television and, and recorded every TV broadcast that we could, the audio from the BBC and from ITV as it was, because there was only a couple of TV stations at the time. And uh, I have very, very fond memories of doing some really goofy stuff uh, around the Apollo missions with my father, uh, getting us in to watch things like the ticker tape parade in New York when Neil and Mike and Buzz came back. And we snuck into a very prestigious hotel on the south coast of England, pos posing as guests of some lord to get into the television lounge so we could watch it live on the TV at the time. So we were fanatics and we made Ravel model kits and... and I had major Matt Mason toys and uh, uh, it wow. was a big deal. Now, did you, during this, this phase of your life, did, was space pretty close to science fiction or did you feel like there was some real tangibleness to it or, you know, how close it was cool to watch, but was it something that you were, you felt like you could engage in? Well, I was a huge science fiction fan from as early as I can remember. I can actually remember watching the very first episode of Doctor Who the night it aired in 1963. Um, I grew up on things like Jerry Anderson's Thunderbirds and Fireball XL5. You know, I also remember going to see uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey the year it opened in 1968. We went and saw it on a Cinerama screen in Cardiff in South Wales. And, you know, that changed everybody's perspective about what space travel might be like. Prior to that, you know, we'd seen the, the serials of Buck Rogers and, and, and yeah. things like that, um, Flash Gordon. But 2001 was such a, a massive leap forward. And uh, I became very fond of Arthur Clarke and Isaac Asimov, uh, their science fiction books. I, I still have 
I think 400 Asimov books downstairs. Um, I have a signed first edition of 2001 that I had signed by Arthur and Keir DeLay and Gary Lockwood and, and Dan Richter and, and you name it, they've all signed it. <laughs> um, yeah, so all of that seemed like it was going to happen, although I have to admit that in 1968, the year 2001 seemed impossibly far away. I was going to be in my 40s and I thought I'm never going to live that long. Um, so, you know, when they, they actually started to fly, it was a bit more visceral than, than some of the science fiction things I'd grown up on, but it was incredibly exciting and you just wanted to be there. I would have given anything to have seen a Saturn V launch as a kid. And as you grew up and got into like a professional career, what was it that, like, where was space prior to the events that you're going to <laughs> regale us with in a few minutes here? What was your life like, um, you know, was space, as you become an adult, was, was it still a thing that was like really of interest? In it never or? went away for me. Okay. Um, although, you know, it was not something that I ever dreamt of being involved with because okay. my, my principal, you know, thing that I wanted to be involved with as a kid was the music business. And, you know, I'd, I'd grown up listening to Hendrix and Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin and stuff like that. And I desperately wanted to be in the music business. And that's where I ended up. Honestly, to my considerable surprise, I ended up working with some of my heroes from that industry as well. Ended up managing bands and owning my own record company and doing all the things I wanted to do. And then around 1998, when things were going swingingly well for the record company, um, I had been publishing books to sell with the records. So I would do box sets where you'd bundle a CD and a book together, and then you right. could sell that to both record stores and bookstores. And um, in the meantime, my brother Richard uh, had f uh, found the Space Frontier Foundation. He had ended up being closely involved uh, with Rick Tomlinson. But uh, then in the summer of uh, 1998, he asked me if I wanted to come to a conference in Los Angeles and uh, maybe meet some astronauts. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm hosting the 30th anniversary bash for the Apollo 7 crew. And I thought, well, I remember those guys. I, I know who Wally Sherrar is. And I remember Walt Cunningham and Don Isley. And so I said, yeah, I'll come and maybe meet Wally, you know. So they uh, know to an opportunity like that, right? And like, yeah, were you in LA at the time, or no? You, I was okay. in I was in Toronto. Toronto, okay. And uh, and so I flew down to LAX, and got this shuttle from LAX to the Sheraton at the airport there. Walked into the lobby, and there was my brother's wife Marietta standing with Buzz right there in the lobby. And uh, I recognized him immediately. I mean, it's <laughs> not like you could not recognize Buzz. But I have to say, I was incredibly surprised because I had no idea Buzz was, uh, you know, closely working with SFF or indeed was even doing much public appearances at the time. I wasn't keeping that close a tag on him. So uh, 20 minutes later, I'm sitting for dinner with Buzz and his son and uh, Walt Cunningham and his wife, Dot, and Andy Chaikin, who had written From the Earth to the Moon, the big HBO miniseries. And I sat there speechless for about two hours, <laughs> listening to these guys tell war stories. I, honestly, I didn't know what to say. I was I was just dumbstruck because Buzz was literally sitting right next to me. And there was only seven of us at the table. And you've uh, hung out with like rock stars and musicians. And so like, you're not dumbstruck hanging out with them, right? Like, well, I, ha I have to say, I had been in an elevator with Buzz a few years earlier. I, I was at the I was at the Super Bowl, and I, I had a press pass for the Super Bowl in San Diego. The hotel for the press at the Super Bowl is overrun with celebrities. I mean, there's all kinds of famous people right. there. In the space of five minutes, I was within two feet of Buzz and two feet of Bob Hope. <laughs> um, and and I ended up getting into an elevator with Buzz just purely by accident. And his wife at the time, uh, Lois, was there. And I knew who he was. And I didn't dare say anything because he was talking to his wife. And I didn't want to be rude and interrupt him. Um, and so when I met him at dinner that night, of course, he was never going to remember me because I hadn't <laughs> said anything to him. Elevator, yeah. <laughs> um, but at the end of the evening, we had the coffee. And he took, turned and looked at me. And he said, so what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a book publisher. and I own a record company. And he just said, 
well, you can do me a favor. And I had no idea what favor he was going to ask, but it probably wouldn't have mattered. Yeah. I just, I just said, okay. <laughs> and, uh, he then said, you know, he said, there's a, there's an anniversary thing coming up and I'm wondering if you could do a book for the anniversary. And, you know, I'm not that stupid. I said, Apollo eight, you know, cause we were there for the Apollo seven dinner. And he said, yeah. And I said, uh, what do you want me to do? And he said, could you do a special book, a sort of tribute book for the crew? Um, and I said, yeah, I can do that. I had no idea what I was going to do. Um, so we broke up from dinner that night and I had made a deal with him. I said, if I do it in time, will you invite me to the event and yeah. intro introduce me to the crew? And he, and he said, yeah. So, uh, the next morning I came down for breakfast and I had to be back in Toronto, uh, that night I came down for breakfast and Andy Chaikin was sitting at the table. And, uh, so we had breakfast together and I told Andy what Buzz had asked me to do. And Andy said, well, you know, you should do this and he gave me some suggestions i'd already thought of something i was going to do and he supplemented it with better ideas and uh so then i flew back to toronto phoned my printer and said if i need a book in my hands by december the 6th uh, when would i have to hand it in to you guys and they said no later than 3 15 on monday and that was thursday <laughs> so okay i then got on the phone to NASA headquarters and I said, I have a six inch roll of fax paper on my fax machine. Um, can you use it please? And <laughs> I sat there with the fax machine, just rolling and rolling and rolling for hours with all this data about Apollo eight. And then I didn't go home for 48 hours, got the book to the printer with 15 minutes to spare. And then I went on the road to Chicago for the big bash and Buzz was good to his word. He introduced me to Borman Lovell and Anders. Jim Lovell took a look at the book that I'd done. This one, I just happened to have here. How, happen coinci to how coincidental this book here, which yeah. I deliberate, which I deliberately, deliberately made look like National Geographic because I thought it would sit ah, nicely, nice. nicely on my yeah. shelves with the National Geographic books. Nice. And Jim, Lo Jim Lovell said very kindly, he said, it, it's, it's nice to see somebody doing it right for a change. And I was, that was it. Drop the mic. I'm done. And, uh, <laughs> and at the end of the night, Buzz came over to me and he said, Apollo 9's anniversary is in March. And I said, okay. <laughs> so after, you know, a, a very quick turn and then he's got something else to throw to you. And now you're an old hand at it and you're like, sure, I guess I'll do another one. Or like, it just was so cool. I mean, Everything about the SFF conference was cool. I had no idea what to expect. I'd never been to one. I'm suddenly in a room with people who had been my heroes. I got to meet the, the founders of the group, um, Rick Tomlinson, Bob Worth, Jim Muncie. And they struck me as a bunch of really driven, cool guys. I thought, yeah, I can do this again. This is fun. Clearly is a story of someone who's not a, you know, not a, an engineer and you haven't been obsessed. You've been infatuated with space, but not obsessed with space. Maybe like, you know, you're, you have a career, you have a, this is an interesting passion, but it wasn't your career. But then, you know, after you're bringing in the skill sets that maybe weren't in the room previously, I got um, infected. Yeah. <laughs> and what did that, what have those Apollo books turned into after that? Well, um, I'd like to think it's turned into a, a, a reputable imprint. On the shelf behind me, you can see some of it. I think, I don't know, 120 or 140 space books now in the last 25 years. I got the incredible privilege of working with pretty much all of those famous people from the 60s, but not just not just the famous people, also all these brilliant guys that work behind the scenes. And I mean, engineers and scientists and managers and historians and writers and, and advocates, you know, people who, who spend their time doing nothing but trying to keep the ball in the air. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just become all consuming, I suppose. Um, well, um, I know you're heading for a vacation after a lot of years um, and as someone who, you know, I, I came into this industry a little bit after your meeting with Buzz, 
and I'm still trying to get caught up and understand how all of these pieces fit together. But it's it is great to know uh, the guy who is committing those things to the page and making sure these things get published and and get out there so people can learn um, what it is that went into. Well, indeed, you know, one of the highlights of that was was being asked to publish Jerry O'Neill's Bible. You know, the, yeah. the, the one the other one I happen to have here. Yeah, look at that. The High Frontier with the wonderful cover by Peter Thorpe. Um, and this this was the one that we did that had the extra stuff in it from Freeman Dyson and, and Rick Tomlinson commit, uh, did some stuff for it as well. But, you know, Bob Werb asked me at the time it was out of print and it had been out of print for some time. And this was still very early days for the Internet. So the notion of ebooks was, you know, non-existent. And um, they said, you know, we, we would really like to have this book in print and have it remain in print. Would you do that? And I said, yeah. Out of print. So this is, again, in the context of these other conversations, the O'Neillian vision of the future is the thing that is the antidote to some of the feelings that, like, our space program was grinding to a bureaucratic halt. And it what when you say not in print, just in case there's someone under the age of sure. Know, well, orig thought, originally anyway. most most of what Jerry had written, uh, most of the information that was generated prior to that book, was done at a NASA uh, conference, I think, in 19 I want to say 75 or 76, and somewhere on the shelf over here behind me are the original prints of that as well, the NASA publications of that conference, and the book had been in print for a number of years it had been available in bookshops uh, in a number of different editions um, but not changed very much very little new information because uh, you know jerry had passed away um, but then it sort of faded away and and was not available to, you know there was no amazon to speak of right in, in 1998 there certainly was no online used book retailers where you could just click and poof the books there for you um, and and so the vision was sort of gone. It was it was it was ephemeral, and uh, and so when when Bob asked me if I Bob Werb asked me if I would keep it in print, I said yeah. You know, as long as I'm breathing, I can do that. And um, and so when we brought that edition out, it was the first time a new edition with edition with uh, you know comments by Freeman Dyson and, and Rick Tomlinson and so forth. Um, it was the first time that edition had come out, but it was also the first time that people could actually go and buy a copy of it readily at Barnes and Noble or Borders or, or Walden Books or whatever, you know, their local bookshop was. And that's, I mean, it's it's a slightly different world, but like the fact that the the founding document, the the you know, the, the prophet who has delivered this idea of the future that everyone talks about. Um, but the, the fact that you couldn't get the text for some period of time is, is kind of crazy. But I do greatly appreciate the fact that you have taken on that task, that uh, Bob asked you to help, and that Buzz asked you to help. Um, and, you know, there are some people that think space is, is inaccessible it is really cool but it's really far away um and it is really cool but you have a found out that it's it's not inaccessible and b you've helped make it accessible for more and more people so um i've got one yeah, really... just one one small piece of of you know a very big puzzle you know <laughs> that is awesome um any uh recommendations for any any of the the newer rising folks that might not have come from that traditional aerospace background uh any any word pearls of wisdom um that you think might apply to their trajectory if they are like you were infatuated with space well i as you can imagine i would urge them to read as much as possible um and, and <laughs> learn learn that learn the history of the subject because, uh, you know, a lot of people are con constantly reinventing the wheel when they don't need to. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something that you can see. I mean, Elon Musk has done some remarkable new inventions, but he's building on the shoulders of giants, as they say. And, and yeah. he was a student of Werner von Braun. You know, he read everything that von Braun had written before he sat down and said, I can build a rocket engine. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the, the fundamentals of this 
as as an editor editing all these books you end up taking on a lot of it just purely by osmosis you real you start to realize you know <laughs> that eva you know and what an eva is or an emu or whatever you start to take all that in and um and then you start to draw the connections the dots between how we got from a to b and what went wrong in the meantime and so as a sort of um amateur historian if that's what you want to call me i'm on two history committees um i've learned an enormous amount going all the way back to the first books written on the subject in english in the 30s which is the books that inspired arthur c Clarke, who then went on to you know virtually invent the communication satellite uh, if you read it from the beginning which i've spent a lot of time doing uh, you start to see the, the big put the big picture and then finding the pieces that fit in the puzzle become easier that is great. Uh, Rob Godwin, thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome once again to the Commercial Space Pioneers Conversations. I have the distinct pleasure today to talk to Sam, and Sam has been involved in and around the Space Frontier Foundation and Commercial Space for many years. And when before we get into like the foundation stuff, tell me a little bit about retro futurist. I believe that <laughs> the uh, the the how you view yourself. So this will be a good context for the conversation to follow. I'm using the term retro futurist instead of just futurist because it feels the term futurist feels a little pompous, like I have the vision of the future and I'm going to predict the next big thing, which of course, you know, everybody's been talking about O'Neill colonies for how many decades now? But as a retro futurist, I'm kind of, I'm looking at the past and seeing how they envision the future and grabbing pieces, parts of that and learning lessons from that to apply to some of these ideas that we're doing today. One thing you may want to consider is uh, the foundation should maybe consider creating a book on all of the dead companies that have come and gone because the this, this future of the space industry is driven on top of the bodies of the previous companies. Everybody has a grand idea, a grand scheme, and I, through the decades of seeing the Space Frontier Foundation, there are some great ideas and great folks but they didn't have the right engineering or they didn't have the right marketing. Case in point, Robert Bigelow, he's, he was yep. a multimillionaire. He licensed the TransTab technology from NASA. He uh, built these, these, pro these space stations, these prototype space stations, sent them twice, 2005, yep. 2007 in orbit, and eventually got a contract with NASA to build this little inflatable on the space station. Still there now, right? Yes. Yep. Uh, but he, he finally went out of business after 20 years because the model didn't work. He was ahead of his time. Yep. Some of those same themes repeat and repeat. Take me back, if you, if you, if you will, to the younger Sam. What was the sort of thing that, like, were you thinking about space in your formative years? Were you a STEAM student or a STEM student back, or, you know, before the term existed? I've been involved with STEM and STEAM before it was STEM and STEAM because, you know, Kids need to learn. Kids need inspiration. They need they need to see people doing wild and crazy things, not just boring corporate stuff, but actual feats of imagination. Your framework, even from an early age, is you were a. No, I haven't even gotten to that no? yet. Okay. <laughs> I haven't to that yet. All right. Uh, and just just in case there's someone who isn't familiar with the idea of makerspace, how would you describe it? Yeah, so the maker movement started, actually, it's it's always been around. You've always had that mad scientist guy, that tinkerer, that someone who wants to build. You know, everybody's got a hobby where they're they're building, like, they're, they're rebuilding a watch or they're, they're, they're building some type of invention. Children, when they're allowed to, can play and invent wacky things with Lego blocks and so on. The maker, maker movement came around because it gave people the a venue an opportunity a place to develop and learn how to build stuff one thing i've learned of course is that it's hard to teach adults anything 
But if you get their kids involved and excited about a thing, then the parents pay attention. So the maker movement kind of started back 2006, 2005 or so, offshoot of Make Magazine. And the idea was to get more people excited about science and art and technology and building things, getting your hands dirty. We've been surrounded by computers and technology for so long. All we do is look at these boxes all bloody day long. But when's the last time you got your hands dirty, you made mistakes, you physically cut things and made things and you welded and you're soldered. And so the maker yeah. fairs are that gateway of educating people about these things. That ethic, that idea of let's go out and figure things out is very, very prevalent in the commercial space industry. A lot of what we were doing was figuring things out, figuring other ways around. Instead of just following the way things have been done, we had to innovate. We chose the hardest hobby yeah. ever. How do we build a better yeah. spaceship? And are we going to use exotic propulsion A or exotic propulsion B? Or do we just simply use peroxide? Or do we use this other material? Okay. And so you know what? It's okay. Make it, build it, blow it up. Fine. Don't get killed. That'd be great. And yep. then take it to the next level. The hard part was taking it to the next level because we love to tinker and you can build and blow up rockets all day long. I mean, you can buy some SD's rockets and fly them, but how do you take it to the next level of, okay, I want to put a person on it. Yo, oh, yeah. That, Scary okay. Job. So Sam, were you a maker? Did you have that maker mindset when you were younger? I was not a maker when I was a kid. You okay. Know, I was born in Buffalo, New York, raised in Orlando, Florida, bored out of my mind. My dad kept try trying to push me into engineering schools. I was like, but my SAT scores for English was always much higher than my verbal, my, my for math. So, you know, yeah. I was always more arts oriented, more creative oriented. It I've been really a space matter. cadet since I was born. Okay. Oh. I was bo you know, born in 1967, Apollo landing in 69. I was a space fanatic since day one, huge fan. Like everybody in our generation, we were surrounded by NASA, Apollo, the glory days, the right stuff, all that imagination, all the science fiction films. Yes. I was one of those other fanatics from day one. I wanted to be an astronaut, had no idea how to do it or how to get okay. other people to do it. Good, good. All right. So it was the TV shows. It was the commercials. It was the toys. It was all that stuff afterwards. You know, I'm building, you know, I was building model aircraft and spacecraft and tanks and all that stuff. And I was just building, building, building with, you know, those, those mo plastic model kits you put together. Yep. You know? Okay. Not everyone knows about those plastic model kits that you put together. So there used to be, you would buy a kit and you would have to then take all of the pieces. Model. Out. Yeah. Plastic model spaceship two, go figure. Yeah. Pretty cool. Um, carefully cut out all the pieces and assemble them and then hang them from your ceiling or something like that. What was the, some of the earlier recollections of what space meant, what it stood for as you were an enthusiast and were going to be a, an astronaut in, in your youth? Was it cool because everyone else thought it was cool or was there something else about it? It was the coolness factor. Absolutely. And, and the adventure of doing something new and extraordinary. I, I was mm. bored. I was bored with the world I was in. Okay. Uh, my nickname for Orlando was Borlando because all you can do there is Disney. And that's about it. Everything, <laughs> everything catered around the mouse. So, so on, all my other high school friends, where they go, they all started working for Disney. What did I do? Mm. Graduated uh, from high school, graduated from college, got a degree in English, specializing in tech writing and editing. First job out of college, technical writer for McDonnell Douglas at the Kennedy Space Center. That was in 1990. All right. Did you stumble into that or was that like, ooh? So in college, cool. so if you want to yeah. talk about 1980s here, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. college, I changed my major multiple times, mechanical engineering, electrical. And then I realized, you know what? I hate doing the math. I mean, the calculus was horrible. Um, they, they dumped me in this horrible class called uh, chemistry for engineers. It was a weed out class. It was horrible. Uh, I need bigger picture stuff. And eventually I discovered, hey, I like to write. I can put words together in pictures. I've read almost you know a ton of Shakespeare. And then I switched gears to English and I discovered there's a subset of English called technical writing. And there's a difference between creative writing and technical writing. And technical writing chops off all the fancy flowery words and expressions and metaphors and, you know, what makes the, everything flowing and colorful and gets the facts. 
get to the bloody facts. What does this do? How do you do this? How do you fix this? Get to the point. And this actually helped me with my writing and communication in general in that I, I've got friends, and you probably have friends too like this, who they love talking in circles. They yeah. never get to the point. Where's that <laughs> point? Where's that yeah. point? So yeah. my job is I just slice in half, get to the point. And that's the thing with a lot of us, you know, frustrated space people. It's like, get to the damn point. Let's go to space now. Why do we have to go through all these political and bureaucratic and infrastructure circles to get where we want to go? Just go. Just go. Build the things. That's one of the reasons I like SpaceX is because they've been blowing rockets up, and they keep blowing them up till they don't blow up, yep. and then you have a system. And that's what they did with airplanes. That's what they did with cars. When you're inventing a thing, you keep breaking it till it stops breaking or it breaks less. Yep. So, McDonnell Douglas. I applied for an ad in the newspaper. You remember those things? I do. So I actually have it here somewhere. It's an ad <laughs> in the Orlando Sentinel newspaper for a job for a technical writer at McDonnell Douglas. So I okay. actually wrote a letter, sent it to them, applied for the job, did an interview, got the job. Blew my mind. So here I am, fresh out of college. It's like a 50-mile drive. Drive through the swampland, go straight to the Space Coast, ready to go. So now you're in the space industry. You're an enthusiast. Very you know, young, fresh out of college. Loving, I'm just loving the fact I'm there. I'm seeing launches. I mean, uh, mm, right. I, one of the fringe benefits of having that badge is I get to watch the launches up close. I'm standing right behind the guys in the emergency suits. They have the flame retardant suits. They got the yeah. tank so that if, the, if anything happens to the shuttle, I'm at the three mile mark watching the shuttle take off. Earth vibrates. Everything shakes. It is like, I mean, tears are coming out of my eyes. This is a beautiful moment because I'm watching this thing take off. I'm about as close as you can humanly get right there. All inspiring, okay? I had the opportunity to take a tour of the space shuttle Endeavor before its maiden voyage. Right, like so you are now in the space industry, first job at a college, you are right there at the cutting edge. Oh, Did but you, you think but more, there's more to it than that. There's Wait. more. So from 1990 to 1995, working at the Kennedy Space Center uh, for McDonnell Douglas, working on payload processing systems. So I am documenting the control system that tests the fit, form, and function of every satellite, every piece of payload that goes into the okay. shuttle payload bay. So we're making sure all that stuff works properly, and I'm documenting the systems. And we're using some of the most more or less advanced systems at that time um, to, to document it. Then another project came up. So I'm working for McDonnell Douglas. McDonnell Douglas is a contractor for NASA at the time. In 19, late 1990, early 1991, some guy named Bill Gobatz made a presentation. Bill Gobatz uh, came to the Kennedy, to the space, to one of the, the one of those space organization meetings in Florida, talking about a little project called the Delta Clipper Experimental. The Delta Clipper Experimental was a new type of vehicle. And it was not being built by NASA. In fact, they made sure it was not being built by NASA. It was actually a DOD project sponsored by the Department of Defense under something called a Strategic Defense Initiative Organization. Remember, remember Ronald Reagan and Brilliant Pebbles, yeah, yeah. all that stuff. We're able to get DOD funding. It was only a mere $90 million, which is a drop in the bucket for the DOD, to build and test a fully reusable rocket ship. Wait, hmm. hold on. I thought Elon was the first one to do that. No, my friend. History time for you. Google DCX. Google Delta Clipper Experimental, my friend. And so now... So there was something before Elon, oh, all the way back in the 90s. Not just the DCX. There were other attempts to do this type of fully reusable rocket ships, but they all crashed and burned for various reasons. Look up Evil Knievel and his rocket plane that went over the Grand Canyon. He's another famous rocket designer. He was working on that stuff. Um, so remember, but before we talk more about the DCX, what was your thought about, like, the shuttle was supposed to be that, right? The shuttle was supposed to be flying multiple times. And as the DCX, as you start to hear about Delta Clipper, was this like the next attempt at doing what the shuttle was supposed to be doing? Or wh wh where was the, sp the room for this idea to even get traction? I'm a young guy learning about how the space industry works. And I'm learning, okay, there's NASA, and then there's these major contractors, you know, 
uh, Boeing and Lockheed and Lockheed Martin, and there are lots of mergers going on, and McDonnell Douglas and Northrop Grumman and all these other corporations are the major contractors, and they've been the same contractors since the days of Apollo back in the 70s. And okay. so what happened since Apollo, NASA basically just became another government bureaucracy. NASA was, they did a thing, and they would hire these contractors to do this thing. And only these five or six contractors were qualified because they were there from the beginning. They have all the right. infrastructure and the equipment and the talent to- well, they've done it. They've done they it. They know how to do it, right? But, but when it comes to new ideas, when it comes to new companies, it's nearly impossible to get into that realm of those five major corporations. It was just these five guys were the gateway to NASA, which is the gateway to funding the space projects. Yeah. And at the time, there was the perception that if it wasn't made by NASA, it couldn't exist. Not invented here syndrome was a term we yeah. used, where you know NASA was the be all and end all. They are the right stuff. They went to the moon. They know everything about space. But you, yeah. Joe Schmo on the street, you got this wacky idea for a rocket. You're just a wacky, crazy guy. No one's going to pay attention to you. Okay. Well, haven't you seen the stacks of technical documents that exist on all of these systems? I mean, as a technical writer, there's all sorts of technical documentation about the complexity that is absolutely essential to create these these vehicles and and all of their pressure and temperatures and they're so like they're on a dusty humans. bookshelf and no one reads those books. They're on a dusty bookshelf somewhere and no one reads those books. Okay. And the only thing that flies is what's been approved by the politicians. Okay. Funded by the folks at the top and whoever lobbied the hardest, which is typically the major, five major corporations yeah. who lobbied really hard with their congressmen to say, hey, I need funding for these districts, these congressional districts right. to keep me going. So and you're so working. It's a system and that's right. it. So you're part of that system. You're one of their five. Yes. Now, did you see DC, the Delta Clipper DCX as a threat? So the DCX yeah. was something new and exciting. It wasn't initiated by NASA. It wasn't coming from on high from all the hierarchies at the very top from DC headquarters, whatever coming down. It was coming from a different direction. Okay. It was from a different place, at least from my perspective. I'm a young guy. I don't know anything about anything about the space industry. And all of a sudden, I'm hearing about this DCX project, and suddenly I'm put on the team. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay. And, and suddenly what I'm hearing is that what they did, because they only had $90 million to spend on this whole project, McDonnell Douglas spread the workload across all of their office across the country all the different teams. So you have Huntington Beach, you have St. Louis, you have Kennedy Space Center, you have other parts around the country. And they did whatever they could do to beg, borrow, and steal equipment and resources and time to build this thing. Uh, case in point, they did something crazy, which I thought was amazing. Um, the Rocketdyne rocket engines for the DCX were rented. They rented the RL-10A5 engines from Rocketdyne. And, in, and when the project is over, they had to return them, which they did. They, who the hell rents a rocket engine? It sounds creative. <laughs> Boom. They, they were doing all sorts of creative and innovative ways to build this thing. And they did it. In 18 months, they worked ridiculous hours, scrounging pieces, parts, and people and resources yeah. to build the prototypes, going to Huntington Beach, scale composites, built the outer shell. They had all these other pieces being compiled here, there, and everywhere. So this thing rolled out in Huntington Beach. Yeah, but I was looking between the lines and saying, okay, these guys are struggling. They're trying to make this thing happen. What can I do? Now, back in the day, I think it was still called the ARPANET or internet or yeah, all right, uh, good. You know, IRC and, and news readers. And so I'm like trying to figure out, well, what's going on? How can I help? And so I'm stumbling upon these people having conversations about the DCX and how to keep it alive and how to fund it and how to make it go further. And suddenly I discovered this thing called space activism. 
What the hell is mm. that? And and then one thing led to another, and there's this conference called the Space Access Conference, and then this group called the Space Frontier Foundation started popping up. I was like, who are these people? I knew about NSS, National Space okay. Society. They're a big yeah. cheerleader group for NASA. Go, NASA, go. But there's these other guys I've never heard of before popping up. And so there's the Space Access Group, a bunch of hardcore folks, and then there was this thing called Space Frontier Foundation. And they're business people. They were trying to promote space, and they love DCX, and they were lobbying Congress to help them get more funding and to keep the project alive. Because what happened in 91? Yeah, 91, they flew the rocket, it landed, and they were out of money. <laughs> they were broke. <laughs> Done. That was it. Okay, they went through this huge effort. They built the rocket, yep. they flew it, and they're broke. So you found, <laughs> not not through um, your job, not necessarily even through your colleagues in the at McDonnell Douglas or there on the Space Coast, but you found this community online that was able to help scratch the itch of DCX is important and should get help. What was your thought about as you're as you something happened in this transition right from getting to work on stuff for the shuttle for nasa which is awesome to that realization that while awesome there was something missing there's a reason i stopped working at the kennedy space center after a few years okay okay it's because well a with the dcx project I was helping, I was trying to find ways to lobby and to get support through like my local congressman and stuff like that, trying to okay. get excitement and go, going to keep funding alive for this project. And this foundation helped relocate the DCX project, a new home. They basically, McDonnell Douglas still worked on it, but they moved it from um, DOD to DARPA and then eventually to some company called NASA. I've and, heard of them. It was a weird situation because almost everybody on the team, at least the leaders at the top, were trying to avoid dealing with NASA. But some things have ch some things changed around the 94, 95 time frame. Some guy named Dan Golden happened. Dan Golden was the administrator for NASA at the time. He came on board and he wanted to make changes. He wanted to get NASA out of its stagnant ways and start innovating. So he started this whole program called Faster, Better, Cheaper. And mm. I keep thinking he got that phrase and idea from the DCX program. I think uh, okay. he agreed, <laughs> to this is my theory, I haven't got proof, yeah. but that he agreed to take on the DCX program as a role model, an example of what a faster, better, cheaper system can be. Now all of a sudden the DCX is a DCX slash A uh, program and they did a bunch of enhancements to Label, the- yeah and the rocket kept flying and they were doing more and more flights um they did a 12 flights the delta clipper experimental or dcx slash a you know as it evolved flew from 91 1991 through 1996 a dozen times took off landed took off landed and did a bunch of different types of experimental you know uh maneuverings in the air and was getting better and better at its flight Nobody knew about the project. Once or twice it got in the news. Everybody thought it was a NASA program anyways. No one, sure, knew, about the history. No one knew of its origin. No one knew or cared in the mainstream industry, the five corporations. No one cared. All they cared about was getting funding to keep the jobs going. That was it. It was not a NASA project initially, and there was not enough incentive. I mean, Dan Golden was trying to encourage the companies to start being innovative and creative and maybe start investing in new projects by themselves yeah no no they just did not want to take chances on spending huge amounts of money on things that may fail period the x33 program had about like four or five different proposals you know from rockwell and from uh, uh boeing and from a bunch of other organizations lockheed martin and one of them was mcdonnell douglas now out of all the five contenders for the x33 project only one was built and flying the DCX was flying. They had a built and flying working prototype. Rockwell had some piece of paper from back in the 70s. They just pulled up and said, hey, we can build this, which is just another shuttle variant. 
Yep. Uh, Boeing had some other thing. Lockheed Martin had this like bizarre, let's throw every advanced technology possible into one package so we get tons of money project. And so, there was Paul Douglas with this thing that was built and flying again and again and again. Guess who won the X-33 contract? The people that had built it and had flown it again and again and again, right? Because that's the thing we... No, no. No. Oh, Lockheed never... Martin won with their Delta-shaped X-33 rocket, and, and it. then that's when the next 10 years of money was... So X-33, for anyone who's not familiar, let's like the short summary there was oh. this was a scaled-down version of the shuttle designed to be like an unmanned thing the x-33 was supposed to be a test program to build a possible replacement for the space shuttle ah okay and so it was going to be unmanned it was just going to be a large-scale prototype and they were going to try to like make it reusable and fly again and again and again but make it more efficient than the space shuttle because with a space shuttle there's a lot of stuff that has to be basically torn apart and rejiggered like the engines yeah. um after every single flight which doesn't make for a very efficient system no. um so that's where the x-33 came in it was like let's build something better what's the next generation of spacecraft which is what you do in most industries is like okay don't build the same car for 100 years you build the next version of it. yeah something better these are the big planks right what was going through your head? So you found Space Frontier. What was your view of the industry and your view of, like, since you want to be a retro futurist, let's go back to you working as a technical writer. What did you think back then the future was going to look like? And how did your awareness of this, the realities of the world start influencing your view of the future? So the Sam Coniglio that joined the Kennedy Space Center McDonnell Douglas in 1990 was not the same person in 1995. Okay. Uh, I, A, I was getting a very basic entry-level salary. And okay. there was no, after five years of that, I was like, dude, cost of living, I, I need a raise. And okay. it was not, it was not going to happen as a government contractor. Basic, I, basic economy, or economics, okay. Yeah, basic economics. And then also I just was discovering this giant bureaucracy for getting anything done. You had you have NASA, and then you have the little contractors over here, and they do whatever NASA says, and that's it. And I was just wondering, where are we going to, you know, where's the innovation? Where's the change? I wasn't seeing that. I was not going anywhere with that. So in, in August 1995, I quit. I just went uh, freelance. I became a freelance job shop, technical writer, traveling the country, going from business to business. I learned about the job shopping field where I can basically, you know, six months here, two months there, 10 months there, doing a contract. Yeah. Contract. So I'm basically a, a gun for hire. And for years okay. I was doing this. In fact, I'm kind of doing it still now to this day. <laughs> um, uh, only on a, a few occasions have I done aerospace projects, but for the most part, for the last 20 years, I'm working for various dot coms. I work for a bunch of startups. Uh, moved to Silicon. I, I went from Florida to Atlanta, Georgia. Then I finally moved to Silicon Valley, where I'm still there today. Usually, it's computer related stuff or internet related yeah. stuff. And I kind of developed a kind of a cynical perspective on life. It's like you know what? I got to eat. I got to have my yeah. day job. I still Bless. have my hobbies. I still have my side projects. I was going to the Space Frontier conferences. I was going to the new space to uh, uh, NSS conferences. I was trying to go. I went to Space Access a couple times. Um, I kept my fingers in the space world. I started doing research on, uh, you know, what's the future, and then I discovered this thing called the X Prize, and mm. that was very interesting. I actually went to the second X Prize gala in St. Louis when they just announced it. Peter Diamandis and those folks were trying to promote this thing. All right, we're back. back. Pause there, because we gotta we gotta fill in a few gaps. Again, there's a few folks who may not know what these different groups and acronyms are. But Go for it. I wanna I wanna reinforce real quick here the combination of forces that led you to just like quit. You had a dream job. Your teenage self would probably think that was a dream job to be able to work indirectly for NASA. Did you think that there was gonna be more 
innovation. It's not just bureaucracy. What was it that was else that was in that split? I might have stayed there. I might have stayed at the Kennedy Space Center doing what I was doing for, for a few more years. But all of a sudden, when this DCX project falls in my lap, I'm like, this is the future. This is where uh, okay. this is where we should be going with space travel. This is the next big thing. Why aren't we innovating? We should be constantly innovating and taking chances and trying new things to help get us to the moon and Mars and so on. We should be living off world now. I learned later about Apollo 17 and 18, the missions that were canceled, that were designed to set up a space base. In order, like for the foundation's idea of human settlement in space, it has got to be more than just an engineering question. And, and that's where desires come in. That's where creativity comes in. There are, at last count, I've seen seven proposed space stations, private space stations, mm -hmm. some of which are actually being built right now. Axiom Space, mm -hmm. for example, and uh, uh, Orbital Reef and some of those other concepts. They're, they're out there, Haven. But what's going inside those vessels? And how are you going to build it? Basically, you need a food testing ground, a kitchen testing ground. You need a farming testing ground. How do you do large scale farming in space? How do you recycle wastewater, waste products? How do you create a sustainable situation in space and to make it comfortable and enjoyable? So we need a testing ground up there to prototype a lot of this stuff. Yeah, yeah so all, yeah. all that stuff. And I've done a ton of research by people, <laughs> you're gonna <laughs> laugh at me, but I've been reading weird books like this, the Septic System oh. Owner's Manual, to learn how we do it on Earth. And yeah. then, okay, how do you, if we do this on Earth, how can we apply that to space? And there are ways, it's just a matter of, you know, because most people don't know how the space environment works. I've been around be long fair, enough. I would say there's a lot of people who don't know how the Earth environment works. Bingo. That's why I talked to <laughs> this guy who was actually on the Biosphere 2 program, Mark Nelson. He published this book called The Wastewater Gardener. He created a system so that all your, you know, number one and number two go into this, this garden and you're growing plants, some of which you can eat. And he created a double septic system yeah. to process the waste products to grow plants. It doesn't smell and it looks pretty. And you can do that on earth right now. What if we change the way we do things on earth, get rid of a centralized sewer system and have a system in your backyard that can process the waste products so you don't have to have wastewater being processed and sent into the ocean. Yeah, and uh, you know, biodigesters where you can actually um, extract the uh, methane and use it as a fuel. I mean, there are- All that. A, yeah, all of that. All right, so yeah, we've looked a little bit into the past and as someone who is not a NASA employee and not working indirectly for NASA, you're still working to advance human settlement of space and you have been doing this all along. And so when you think about these sorts of things, do your Silicon Valley peers think you're the space nut or do they turn to you because you're the guy who actually has some idea what's going on? You I've been at this game so long, people really give me high regard. And okay. you know, for space related questions, they come to me for a lot of this stuff. Because did, they, did they back then? Um, back then it was just a job. Back okay. then it was just a job. Uh, you just did your thing. Uh, when you're living in Florida and you're next to the Space Center, yeah, you, you're either Every working for Disney or you're working <laughs> at the Kennedy Space Center or a used car dealership, okay? Not many other things to do. I mean, real estate, but whatever. Uh, there wasn't, it was just like, eh, that's it. And, 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 you know, I wanted to be inspirational. And, oh, by the way, I'm a board artist and architect. I want, I'm a frustrated architect. I wish I could have been one, but I didn't. I kind of went in a different direction. But uh, I hung out with creative people, artists, writers, creative people, and they treat everybody with respect because it's like, you know, this is your thing. You do it. Yeah. You do painting. You do writing. You do space shuttle design. Okay, sure. Why not? <laughs> In this context, been involved. You've been contributing to the foundation for years. What keeps you, like, what are some of the things that you have loved most about the foundation, Space Frontier Foundation, and the community that's around here? Well, primarily the people. I mean, they are 
pushing the envelope. They they needed a place to express themselves, a place to network, to communicate and share share the ideas, and also get serious about okay. I have this crazy idea. What do you think? And so you know you're at the bar, you have a napkin, you write up a pencil, and you start scribbling the ideas. And so you're commiserating. So you've got the rocket scientist over here. You got the businessman over here. You got the finest guy over there. You've got some wild, crazy, artsy guy over there, and all of a sudden, and gal, and and we just kind of throw ideas together, and then suddenly something happens, and some people actually try to create a real business out of it. Sam, in closing, is there anything folks that are watching this uh, a can do for you, or parting words that you'd like them to be thinking about? I think you need to get out of your shell, branch out, and check out other fields of industries besides space. Look at the world of art and design and architecture and creativity and tinker. Get your hands dirty. Build stuff. Make stuff. Play with stuff. Make mistakes. Who cares? Just get out of just your little world and look around. Even if all you do is walk out the door and take a long hike and talk to your neighbors, talk to strangers on the street, be curious, be curious, be curious about the world. Turn off the social media and turn off the freaking news because it's crap. I don't care left, right, upside down, whatever. It's a distraction. It's all a distraction. Yeah. Go to a maker space. Go to a maker show. Go to a fair. Go to a festival. Interact with people. Be curious about these things. Learn about electronics and soldering. Learn about fashion design. Learn about cutting and building and constructing and get your hands dirty. Yeah. You don't even have to be good at it. That's not even the point. It doesn't it's matter. Just, you can understand how it actually Have works. a hobby. Yeah. I have 20. That's just me. <laughs> I have too many hobbies. Come on. We're all in this together. Let's all work yeah. together. This is all about life, not just space, but life. And let's all work together as a community. And oh, by the way, you find the right people, we can build a rocket ship and go to the moon and blah, blah, blah. Or in my case, build a space station. So anyways, it can happen. Sam Coniglio, he's a, he's an advocate for technical writing. He's an advocate for makerspace. He's an advocate of the Space Frontier Foundation. Uh, and I appreciate all of the work and support that you've given to the organization. So thank you very much and look forward to helping create some more stories. Sounds good. Thanks, Sam.